A um, approach zero. So when you let A approach zero, it, uh, minus A to plus A gets very small, and this becomes very spiky, right? And so what that tells us is, is that delta X, we look at over here, what we're going to look at is what the envelope looks like as a function of K. Is that the K space the next space? K space, yes, thank you guys. K space, that was the whole point. When we look at 5K, it turns out to be constant. It turns out to be, it turns out to be this, that uh, 5K, 5K equals, it, it's a constant. So what does that mean in K space? So in X space, we know where the particle is very well. But now what happens in um, K space? Do we know K very well? Not no. whole. Okay, and if we don't know K very well, what does that mean? Why, you're right, it's momentum, because what is momentum equal? That's velocity squared. H K. Right. It, it equals H bar K. H bar K. Yeah. yeah. All right, so what we've done is we've confined this. Delta X is, is small. Delta, delta K equals huge. You know, like over here, you could think almost like a Gaussian, that there's a, um, a, a, a standard deviation, and there's a certain width, and, what ha and the width we relate to an error, right? And so as that width gets small, the error becomes error. incredibly small. But then if you were to make this into a Gaussian, what would you make that width? Incredibly big, all right? And so in other words, our case space error becomes infinitely huge. Which is the same thing as saying delta P becomes huge. Which then is a statement of delta X, delta P greater than or equal to H bar over 2. So this is, a, this is another way to look at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That our wave packet most definitely obeys the uncertainty principle. Everybody see that? And if you were to have like a sharp peak in, in your K space representation, that would mean like a, a larger A more spread out. So Jeremy nailed that. It's the next figure, all right? It's figure uh, 210, but without looking. Because it's the inverse of proportional graphs. Yeah, so, what, so Jeremy says, well, how would you get a finely spiked envelope? Right, the opposite, just flip it. Through. And then what would happen to the A's? It would be a constant. It would be big. So that's exactly right. So if you pay attention to figure 2.10, so 2.10 is let a limit A go to plus or minus A go to infinite. So that becomes that this is now the wave function at time equals zero. Right? Mm -hmm. And as Jerry mentioned, when you do the Fourier transform, so if you put it in it, you put in, sorry, so you put in over here the wave function at time equals zero and equals a constant and do the integral and solve for, solve for your uh, probability density, which is the Fourier transform, right? Mm -hmm. Or the Fourier integral. Then what you're going to find out is that this thing becomes, I think there are a little bumps here, but it's going to be well defined. So this is figure 210. And so what's happening here? What's delta x now in our x space? Huge. Huge. And what's delta p? Small. Small, fine. Okay. Good stuff. Everybody have a feel for it? A little bit better feel today? All right, good. I'm getting some thumbs up, which is good. It all depends on if you know x, you don't know p, Sum all that up into the the Heisenberg and principle. That's all it is. And remember, here's the scoop, guys. Don't forget this. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is no mysterious thing in some sense. Classical waves have an uncertainty principle. All right? Classical waves have, you know, a classical wave of a given wavelength, right? You know, and if it goes to plus or minus infinity, you say, where is it? So it has a well-defined wavelength, which means if it has a well-defined wavelength, it has a well-defined momentum.
done. And if it has a well-defined wavelength with a well-defined momentum, what does it mean where it is? Okay, so that's it. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in some sense is not so mysterious because classical waves have that same relationship. They don't have the H bar in there. It's like delta x delta p is greater than or equal to a half or something like that. All right? Um, and it's no surprise that when we go into quantum mechanics that we're doing waves, right, that they should also have that uncertainty principle in it too. Yeah? Okay. All right, so now, a couple details. So you guys have got the picture. You got the full understanding, the whole machinery. Now let's do the last details, as I've said twice now. Let's find out V group equals V classical. And the other thing that I want to talk about is that the dispersion as a function of time. That if you don't look at your free particle over time, its probability density is going to spread out. Okay? So that's what we're going to do next. And I'm going to follow Griffiths exactly. All right. And hopefully I'll be able to throw in some words that will add to it, but we'll see how that works out. Okay, and I'm actually going to hold the book. All right, I don't do this very often. All right, so here we go. We're going to start off right here with psi in general of x and t. This is top of page 65 equals 1 over the square root of 2 pi. And again, I'm, because I'm following the book, I'm going to throw in the 1 over the square root of 2 pi there. Yeah? Yeah. All right. I'm going to follow the book. Yeah, I'm going to follow the book there. Um, so here we go. From minus infinity to plus infinity of psi k e to the i kx minus omega t where uh, dk, where um, omega equals uh, h bar k squared over 2n. Where did that come from? That's exactly right. That came from the very starting point when we solved for the free particle. Um, and we started off with Schroeder's time independent equation. We got the differential equation. We got a k. That's where that k came from. Okay? Okay, so here's the scoop. Okay, we're now calling this as our, our you know, um, this is our particle. Our particle now equals this. It equals our wave packet. So we're now describing our particle by this total wave packet. All right? Here's the next biggest step, all right? And then the rest is just kind of algebra. All right? What did we also find out about our particle? All right? That for a real particle, can we know its momentum exactly? All right? We can't know its momentum exactly. Everybody kind of agree? You can never know exact position. Right. That that's that's right. right. Okay, so I can't know k exactly. All right, but at the same time, like when I go into an accelerator machine and I ramp up the voltage, I'm putting in a pretty well-defined voltage. Like that, you know, I'm going to make a particle accelerator, and I'm going to accelerate some particles to like 1 GeV. So I know that energy pretty well. Right? So it's reasonable to say that for real particles, do I know the momentum pretty okay though? Do I, I don't know, I admit I don't know exactly, pretty close. Uh, but I know it's pretty close, okay? So the whole argument from here follows from that argument, all right? And it's the idea that although we can't know, we, we admit real particle, real particle, we don't know don't know k exactly, we can make it uh, pretty well, make it, make it known pretty well, right? Because, I mean, I can go to an accelerator and I can turn that dial up to 10,000 uh, volts, and I'm going to change that electrical potential to electrical potential energy and then convert it to kinetic energy from which I can get a classical velocity pretty damn well, right? 
So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, if that's okay, then 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 k zero, right, is kind of our center wave number or momentum, right? Because momentum equals h bar k. So everybody agree that you know basically if I have a particle, it's going to have a momentum centered about this k zero, all right? And since omega, and remember, energy, energy total of a wave equals h bar omega. So essentially when we talk about omega, we're talking about energy, all right? But we also know over here that omega equals a function of k, all right? What we're going to do next is take a Taylor series expansion. Expansion of omega about k zero. You saying now k naught is the center. So k naught, but yeah. So k naught. I mean, think of this as that I just made this particle. You know. Wherever you live in the Williams house at night now, you take all the equipment and you make accelerators, right, and particles. And so you dial your machine up to 10,000 volts. So the first term would be... So you have zero. set that potential energy very well. And that potential energy is going to turn into a kinetic energy. So I know that kinetic energy and I know that momentum fairly well, but not perfectly. I can't know it was perfect because of the argument that I just did, that we have the uncertainty principle. So K0 represents my best ballpark number of where that wave particle, of where that wave packet momentum is that represents a particle. And it's centered, what's it said? It's centered on? K0. Centered about K0. No, K0 is centered in the center for its moment. Yeah, so what I want to do is take a Taylor series expansion of omega right. about K0. All right? So here's how to take a Taylor series expansion. So omega of um, k0, or well, k plus k0. So we're going to take it about k0. So we're going to define wave numbers from k0. This is just like f of x plus delta x is, e is equal to f of, um, f of x0 plus the derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at x0 times delta x with an approximation. We've done this a million times. Right. Is the second term going to disappear because it's a minimum? So you'll see lots of things are going to happen, all right? So, uh, so we'll write this as, this is approximately, we'll call this omega zero to have to do with the function evaluated at k zero. So we're evaluating omega at k zero plus omega naught prime because, again, why do I have the naught there? Because it's evaluated at k0. It's being evaluated at k0. So you need to be able to answer those questions in your head to have any idea why this is meaningful. All right? And then what I want to do is multiply it times delta k, which is going to be k minus k0. Right? That's delta k. All right? Just, it's exactly what I have here. Okay. All right. So we are now going to follow the steps in Griffiths, and I'll erase this stuff over here. So we're going to worry about the first two channels of the series. Well, let's. So what's going to happen is we're going to get our total wave function essentially in a form related to near k zero like essentially the wave function about k0, and we're going to look at it, and we're going, to, we're going to identify something. And what we're going to do is we're going to identify something as a velocity, and it will turn out to be the group velocity of the wave packet. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to, so we're going to take so this. Dispersion helps us find the velocity? Yeah, I mean, it, well, dispersion is different. Dispersion is the idea that it spreads out, and it will be related to that. All right, but you'll see. Okay, so the next step is 